Nowadays, it is impossible to mention the cartel without a horde of people rushing to tell you just how much they loved Narcos. And while the Netflix series was a smash hit and helped bring cartel cinema to the size it is now, I instead want to talk about something a little different. While Narcos brought the story of Pablo Escobar to millions of televisions, I want to talk about a different take on the modern war on drugs. 2015 Sicario, meaning hitman in Spanish. The film focused on the brutality of the conflict between the Mexican drug cartel and the US government and the shady tactics employed by both sides. Having rose to prominence following his 2013 hit Prisoners, Where's my daughter? Dennis Villeneuve again decided to focus on the world of crime, although this time he moved on from a small-scale local kidnapping to the international drug trade. Wanting to focus on the geopolitics of the issue, Villeneuve was moved by the imagery surrounding the Mexican drug cartel and the war zone-like environments their clashes with authorities caused. To give his film that extra touch of realism, the crew shot on location in Albuquerque and Veracruz, Mexico, although the prospect of shooting in Juarez was limited to purely landscape shots due to the danger of travelling there with the crew. I think Villeneuve's approach to filming this with such a commitment to realism leaves this picture as an unforgettable experience, which gets up close and personal with the horrors of the cartel. While many now know the French-Canadian director from his successes with the Dune franchise, I instead want to focus on his incredible ability to tell a high-stakes, more grounded story. It's just a coincidence that both films heavily involve sand and I swear. I don't like sand. Outside of the direction, Sicario was also praised for its many strong performances. Featuring Emily Blunt, Benicio Del Toro and Josh Brolin, the film's strong lineup of dramatic actors leaves every character feeling fleshed out and deep, especially Blunt's Kate Mesa. Alongside Blunt, Brolin and Del Toro both provide some excellent supporting performances, steeped in a tense mystery, as the plot keeps information about their characters to a minimum. The three main characters are fundamental to the drama of the story as Villeneuve chose to keep the villain largely faceless until the film's close, meaning the tension is heavily dependent on the core characters themselves and their relationships between each other. Now before I start spoiling the story of this film, I encourage that you try and check it out for yourself as it's definitely worth a viewing, but without further ado, let's get into the plot of Sicario, and be warned, this video will contain significant plot spoilers throughout. The film opens on a shot of suburban Arizona, before the distinctive silhouette of FBI SWAT officers appear against the desert backdrop. Moving in on a small bungalow, the agents begin to set up a perimeter as snipers watch over. The contrast of this opening shot is fantastic, as the idea of a quiet suburban town is immediately disrupted by the armed figures of law enforcement, immediately cluing the audience in to the severity of the situation. We cut away from this establishing shot to the interior of an armoured van, the hot sun glaring through the windows. Here we get our first look at Kate Mesa as she glances over at her partner Reggie, played by Daniel Kaluuya. She's clearly razor-focused, however there is an element of unease to her character as she prepares for what's to come. The claustrophobic view of the van interior adds to this unease, leaving audience members anticipating the worst from whatever's coming. Shifting away to an interior, we see a man slumped in front of a TV, but before he can finish his legendary playthrough of Halo Reach, the rear of the SWAT van comes crashing through the wall. Flashbangs quickly go off before the officers rush out, arresting everyone in the building. Mesa heads to assist with the sweeping of the house, entering a room where a man blasts a shotgun at her with little warning. Diving to the floor, Mesa narrowly evades death and kills the man, but something behind the bullet holes catches Reggie's eye. Stripping away at the walls, Mesa and the other officers are greeted by the sights of heavily decayed corpses lining the inside of the structure, with the smell causing Mesa and her officers to start vomiting. As if the image of a house of corpses wasn't distressing enough, Villeneuve uses shots of the team vomiting to immediately upset the audience, as many often find themselves unable to watch videos of somebody else being sick. It's when we cut to Reggie outside that he reveals that the team were looking for hostages, as shots of the interior show that almost every wall in the building has been filled with naked bodies, likely asphyxiated to death with the plastic bags over their heads. The FBI higher-ups arrive, revealing that the house is connected to Manuel Diaz, the head of a Mexican cartel, although they have no way to officially connect him to the building. Still disturbed by what he's witnessed, Reggie has to step back outside to vomit again, where he sees two police officers searching the shed. Under the contents of the small shack, they find a locked trap door and call for help. As Mesa heads for the door to see what was found, the shed suddenly explodes, knocking Mesa to the floor as dust fills the room. As she gets to her feet, we see the damage done by the blast. Viscera lies at her feet whilst wounded officers frantically crawl around, desperately seeking help. Yet more carnage at the hands of the cartel. Although extreme in its approach, 
The shootout and bombing bears a resemblance to some of the incidents between US law enforcement and the cartels across the border. Phoenix in particular has been a victim of multiple shootings and bomb threats, and in setting its opening act there, Sicario tells the audience just how substantial the cartel threat has become domestically. It's after the bombing that our intro ends, having introduced us to Kate and her background in the FBI as well as showing us some of the distressing cartel imagery I spoke about in the intro. Contrast of the small American suburb against the brutality of a drug cartel is stark and sudden and the reactions of the FBI officers likely mirror the shock of the viewer. The sight of a building filled with corpses is disturbing enough, but before you have a chance to properly process what you've just seen, the explosion of the shed quickly reminds you of the clear and present danger of the cartel. Whilst most cartel media focuses on their South American presence, Sicario immediately establishes their presence within the United States, doing away with the safety the country has normally represented in the genre. Following on from the morning's tragic events, we see Mesa in the shower as she attempts to clean a wound on her head, the blood washing over her embodying the weight she feels from those who lost their lives today. Given her close involvement to the attack and her tactical expertise, Kate is summoned by her superiors to volunteer for a specialist anti-cartel task force, led by Josh Brolin's Matt Graver. Graver tells her his task force is designed to hit back at the cartel kingpins responsible for the previous day's attack, although the details are sparing, with the concept of revenge clearly drawing Kate in. Despite her desire to join, Kate has to volunteer herself for the operation, hinting at the shady, off-the-books nature of the task force. After signing up, Kate travels with Graver to board a private jet, where she's told they're headed to an airbase in Tennessee. It's here that we first meet Alejandro Gillick, Benicio del Toro's character, as he boards the plane alongside Kate and Matt. Wearing a beige suit, Gillick waits for them at the runway, already hinting at his separation from the rest of Graver's agents. He says very little to Kate as they prepare for takeoff, and when she presses him for any information she may need to know, he simply tells her, you are asking me how our watch works. For now, just keep an eye on the time. Kate is pretty clearly a fish out of water in this situation, and she begins to suspect that she's involved in something she's ill-prepared for. Given the audience has thus far followed the story through her eyes, their questions are no doubt piling up alongside hers, only adding to the building sense of mystery that surrounds Graver and his mission. Despite her reservations, Kate's devotion to the cause encourages her to carry on, willing to set aside her questions in pursuit of what she thinks is right. Once they've landed in Texas, Kate realises they've arrived at a military base, but she keeps her questions to a minimum as she meets with another one of Graver's colourful agents. When I pee, it burns. Here they meet up with soldiers from Delta Force and the US Marshals. They're briefed on their mission. They'll be travelling into Juarez to extract a cartel figurehead and bring him back to the States for questioning. They're told to trust no one who they can't see in that briefing room, as even the Mexican federal troops could be compromised by the cartel. Their convoy will take a relatively straightforward route, but the traffic at the border crossing represents an opportunity for a cartel ambush. After the briefing, Kay again presses Alejandro for information. He reveals he used to work in Juarez as a prosecutor, a position that likely put him in the cartel's sights. He's again evasive about who he works for now, but he does reveal he was sent to Graver's team from Colombia. He leaves Kate with yet another cryptic piece of advice. Nothing will make sense to your American ears, and you will doubt everything that we do, but in the end you will understand. Desperate for some answers, Kate presses Graver to tell her if he's CIA or not, but he again shuts her down. Her devotion to doing things the right way compels her to challenge him, but he again holds revenge for those responsible for the Arizona incident over her head, and she eventually gives in, gearing up for their trip to Mexico. Loading into a convoy of vehicles, the Americans and Alejandro cross into Mexico and join up with the federal troops. As they travel, dozens more vehicles join them, all carrying heavily armed soldiers, really selling just how dangerous of an environment Juarez is. It's in the city that some of the most striking cartel imagery is on display. Villeneuve was influenced by the extreme brutality employed by rival cartels in current-day Mexican cities, and aimed to emulate the degree of violence that has been seen across the country. The most notable example is something Kate sees en route to the courthouse, as the camera pans to a group of dismembered dead bodies hung prominently from a bridge. One of Graver's agents even comments on the nature of the brutality, labelling the approach clever as such a violent death sends a clear message to all those who witness it. En route to the pickup, distant gunfire brings the convoy to a stop where Graver informs them via comms that they're changing route to avoid rumoured cartel activity. Despite the numerous armed soldiers and vehicles, Kate is just as exposed to the threat of the cartel as she was back in Phoenix, with tension building as she heads further into unknown territory. Upon arriving at the courthouse and retrieving their target, the convoy begins their journey back towards the border with everyone on high alert for an ambush. As they drive through the crowded Juarez streets, Kate notices a police car driving parallel to them a block away. Before she can get a closer look, 
the car vanishes behind a building. Thinking back to what was said at the briefing, we know that Mexican law enforcement cannot be trusted, raising the possibility that this police car was in fact a spotter for the cartel. As they approach the border, their Mexican federal escort leaves them as they prepare to be welcomed by US agents at the checkpoint. The traffic at the border is at a standstill, but the convoy is waved through. That is until they are forced to stop, as a miscommunication with the traffic direction leaves them stranded in a sea of cars. Alejandro is immediately on edge as cars filled with tattooed men begin to appear all around them. Kate notices the prying eyes on their vehicle, and Alejandro takes aim with his rifle. He notices a gun, and the soldiers in the vehicle immediately disembark and approach, all except Kate, who remains in her seat. Slowly walking towards their vehicle, Alejandro attempts to reason with the men to put down their weapons and let them pass. The scene is suffocatingly tense as the men share rapid glances and their hands hover over their gun. Suddenly, one reaches for his weapon, and that's when Alejandro and his men open fire. The violence is quick and bloody, and the public nature of the shootout is reminiscent of some of the cartel's display of violence that we've seen, drawing an unflattering parallel between Mexican organized crime and US special forces. Back in the car, Kate is shocked by the sudden outburst of violence, before she notices a Mexican federal trooper taking aim at her through the rear view mirror. Ducking down quickly, she again narrowly escapes death before killing the officer. Despite the earlier warning, Kate is rattled by what has just happened. Given her background in law enforcement, She's likely never had to treat those around her with such a degree of suspicion, and taking the life of another police officer goes against everything she once believed in, even if he was on the cartel's payroll. Back in the US, the cartel figurehead, whose name is revealed to be Guillermo, is taken to a temporary building out in the desert for interrogation. It's here we learn a little more about Alejandro's background, as a Mexican prosecutor recognises him and greets him, referring to him as a ghost. The man reveals he had tried to prevent any attempts to intercept the convoy, but what happened at the border was likely conducted by a splinter faction out of his control. Furthermore, he also shares rumours of a tunnel under the Mexican border that the cartel have been using to travel freely between the two countries, information that spikes Alejandro's interest. Although their conversation is brief, it provides some more vital information in understanding who Alejandro is. Although he had said he was a prosecutor, we now know that he at some point had dealings with the cartel, enough to establish a rapport with their representation. The lawyer treats him like an old friend, but in calling him a ghost we are given a hint that perhaps the cartel believe Alejandro to be dead. We also get the first suggestion towards the former prosecutor's motives, as his interest in the tunnels suggests he isn't yet finished below the border. Heading towards the interrogation room, Alejandro turns the lawyer away, warning him that if something were to happen in there, it's for the best that he doesn't witness it. Inside the chamber, Guillermo seems to remember Alejandro, another hint at his cartel connection, before he begins to interrogate him. The interrogation is conducted off camera, but the methods used have been hinted at throughout this scene, although I will not be discussing them here due to the sensitive nature of the topic. If you're interested, I recommend you either give the film a watch for yourself, or look up the interrogation scene on YouTube. We cut away to Kate outside, and as she shares a cigarette with a soldier, she hears the sounds of echoing gunfire coming from across the border. Another reminder of the cartel's looming presence. Under the cover of darkness, Mesa, Graver and Gillick depart the base, en route to Tucson for the morning. Reggie greets them at the gates, but Graver cuts him off when he tries to speak to Kate about what happened, before the camera reveals them to be a closed coach station. In front of them, five border patrol coaches have been stopped, with the passengers made to sit on the tarmac. These coaches are primarily used to transport those caught crossing into the United States illegally back into Mexico, so having them stopped within the US border is highly unusual. When an officer presses Graver for the reason behind stopping the buses, he immediately deflects the decision onto Kate and walks away before she can argue. Finishing a cigarette, Kate begins to approach the crowd, and it's here that the soundtrack really blew me away. Her walk to the crowd is backed by this ambient hum that slowly gets louder as she approaches, sounding like a chorus of distorted voices as she shares looks with those on the floor. Composed by Johan Johansson, the Icelandic composer spoke about trying to write music that physically affects the viewer, and I think this scene is a great example of that. The low hum creates this unpleasant tension throughout, and given the lack of answers both Kate and the audience have been given, I find myself feeling as if something could happen at any moment. Dennis Villeneuve likened the score to subtle war music, an interesting contrast that perfectly describes the music in this scene. Unfortunately, Johansson passed away in February of 2018, aged just 48 years old, and I think his work on Sicario is testament to just how talented of a composer he was. We soon learn the purpose of this mass traffic stop, as Alejandro begins to ask the Mexican bus passengers about the location of the crossing tunnel. One man eventually reveals it and mentions the cartel presence at the entrance. Frustrated at the lack of information, Reggie demands Matt tells him the purpose of their operations and threatens to walk away. Graver disregards the threat until Kate threatens to join in, 
eventually pushing Matt to reveal their search of the tunnel to them. It's interesting that Matt would happily let Reggie turn his back on them, but losing Kate would seemingly complicate things for them. Graver tells the pair that their goal is to make enough noise so that the cartel recall Manuel Diaz so they can then connect him with his boss. Again, Matt is holding Manuel Diaz above Kate, knowing that her desire for revenge on the man that killed her men will keep her in line. The next morning, Kate spends time looking over the photos from the Arizona raid, as if to remind herself why she's doing what she's doing, whilst Graver and Alejandro plan a sting on a bank where Manuel Diaz is believed to launder his money. Graver asks Kate if she has connections within the Phoenix SWAT, and asks for their help when Kate obliges, perhaps eager for a chance to go back to her by the book route. Staking out the bank, the idea of woman using red and blue rubber bands to deposit large sums of cash and identify her as a mule. Kate and her officers arrest and search her, revealing her purse to be filled with rolled banknotes, but Graver forbids Kate from using them as evidence. Furious, Kate storms into the bank and confronts the manager, but Diaz has cleverly used a series of interest-free loans to make his cash flow legit. The bank manager seems all too aware of Diaz's cartel roots, but with his bank earning a healthy amount of interest off his deposits, I doubt he cared to intervene. No further in her attempts to catch Diaz, Kate storms out of the bank, where Reggie suggests they take a night off at a local bar. Kate reluctantly agrees, and once there they bump into one of Reggie's old cop friends. Played by John Bernthal, the charismatic officer Ted is welcomed to their table, and takes a keen interest in Kate. We cut to her apartment, where she and Ted are in the midst of some pretty unfamily friendly activities. That is, until Ted empties his pockets onto the coffee table, where Kate spots a distinctive blue and red rubber band. Realising she knows, Ted tries to calm her down and feign ignorance, but some viewers will have spotted him almost grabbing her by the throat as she attempts to get away from him. His tone slowly changes from calm to commanding as he tells her to stop, until she pushes him away and goes for her gun. Before she can get a shot off, Ted wrestles her to the floor and begins choking her. We see through Kate's eyes as her visions begin to blur, until the distinctive silhouette of Alejandro appears, with a gun to Ted's head. This scene is oppressively tense, as Kate slowly attempts to make her escape from Ted before he so quickly overpowers her. When in uniform, we have seen Mesa act quick and decisively, but inside her own home she's almost panicked and vulnerable, another clue to the reach of the cartel. Again, it's another officer of the law that's put her life in danger, and Kate is quickly learning just how deep this operation runs. In the back of a police car, Graver asks a bloodied and bruised Ted just how many officers are on Manuel Diaz's take, but his dismissal of the question earns him a short beating from Alejandro, showing just how far he's willing to go, Graver brings up the idea of federal protection for Ted's daughter, whilst also hinting at just how easily his ex-wife's address could fall into cartel hands. Again, Ted tries to downplay his involvement, earning him a finger in the ear from Alejandro. There really is just something about John Bernthal that leaves directors desperate to see him suffer. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Eventually, Ted does give in, surrendering a phone with the names of every informant in the Phoenix Police Department. Checking back in on Kate, Alejandro reveals that Manuel Diaz is set to return to Mexico, and they plan on following him. The next morning, drone footage reveals the location of the tunnel's entrance, and Alejandro checks in on Kate. Having saved her life the night before, his interest in her recovery is a stark contrast to his coldness towards her from before. He even remarks that she reminds him of someone, but who that is he doesn't say. Meanwhile, as the leader of Delta Force describes the likelihood of hostiles in the tunnel, Graver interjects to tell him that the cartel will use local police to move their drugs, so any Mexican uniforms in the tunnel should be considered hostile. He also adds that their operation in the tunnel is simply a diversion, allowing for an agent to cross over into Mexico undetected. Drone shots track Diaz as he leaves for Mexico, whilst Reggie and Kate demand to know what's happening. Graver says he can't risk them running to daddy again, but after pushing for their involvement he allows them to join, on the condition that they hang back while the special ops lead the mission. Kate asks why they're even involved anymore, where Graver coldly reveals that the CIA cannot operate within US borders without a domestic agency attached. Graver has been using Kate all along as a means of validating his extra-legal activities, keeping her attached to the operation by leading her along with the promise of revenge. That's why Kate's been kept in the dark all along. She was never really part of Graver's team, just an asset to allow him to legally carry out his anti-cartel operations. Despite this revelation and Reggie's protests, Kate still pushes ahead with joining the mission, desperate to know what Matt's endgame is. On the car ride over, a phone call tells Graver that they have to hit the tunnel as soon as they arrive, although why isn't made clear to us or Kate. As they arrive at the tunnel entrance, a huge thunderstorm rolls over, plunging the area into darkness. The clouds themselves embody the final stages of Kate's journey into Matt's dark world, choosing to still go ahead with his plan, even after the revelation that he was just using her. We again see the silhouettes of soldiers against the desert backdrop, 
but unlike the FBI raid of the opening, they are now shrouded in darkness, mirroring the darker side of the cartel conflict Mesa now finds herself on. What follows here is a slow, tense walk through the desert, as we watch through night vision goggles as Delta Force slowly approach the tunnel. There isn't too much I can add here, but I just want to quickly talk about the cinematography. On top of this slow desert walk, the camera work throughout Sicario does an incredible job of exemplifying the dangers of the cartel-ravaged Mexico. From aerial wide shots of a harsh, barren desert to close-ups of the dishevelled streets of Juarez, the cartel's homeland feels dangerous and unwelcoming to our lead characters, and the cinematography is fundamental to building this atmosphere. As Delta Force enter the tunnel, we see through Kate's night vision goggles as she steps past bloody footprints and bodies. Compared to the establishing shots of sprawling mountains and desert, the tunnel interior makes for a far more claustrophobic trip across the border. The sound of gunshots and shouting gets ever closer as Mesa progresses through the tunnel, as the cartel conflict reaches its visceral climax. Rounding a corner, Kate reaches a segment of the tunnel illuminated by electric lamps, removing her helmet and following the sound of gunfire. Again, this is another moment where the soundtrack shines, as the blare of a low brass horn punctuates the echoing sound of gunfire. The horn gets louder once Kate removes her helmet, an audible reminder of the increasing sense of danger. Brass is typically associated with the military in anthems, but its distorted use here mirrors the off-the-books nature of Delta Force's mission. Approaching a junction, Kate's rifle is shot out of her hands before Reggie can step in and save her, but as she reaches for her pistol, she notices Alejandro heading further into the tunnel, away from the rest of Delta Force and Graver. Following him, Kate emerges in Mexico and sees Alejandro holding up a police officer, whose car is filled with pink drug packages. As he is taken hostage, the officer asks Alejandro Alejandro is he Medellin, but the man ignores him. Now if you've seen Sicario before, you know this isn't the first time we've seen this police officer, but I've deliberately avoided talking about him until now, so I can go over his whole story at once. In total, there have been three scenes with this police officer and his family, mostly focusing on the relationship between him and his son, as well as providing small details about his cartel connections. The officer, real name Silvio, lives at home with his wife and son, and his scenes for the most part offer short insights into his home life. Silvio's first scene involves his son trying to wake him up, asking him if he can go to his football match. I mean, the kid calls it soccer, but we all know that is just wrong. Silvio declines, saying he has to go to work, and that's when we get our first glimpse of him in his police uniform. In his second scene, we see Silvio's wife and son eating breakfast together. This scene takes place just after the events in Juarez, and we see his wife say a short prayer before eating. To me, Silvio's absence in this scene is meant to lead the audience towards the idea that he may have been the officer killed by Kate, furthered by the mother telling her son that his father is still working when he asks where he is. The third and final scene we get of his family, before Alejandro meets Silvio, sees the boy bring his father breakfast in bed. As Silvio eats his breakfast, his son notices an AK-47 rifle leaning against the bedside table. Before he can reach out and touch it, Silvio stops him, telling him never to touch it. Although Silvio is a police officer, and Mexican police are equipped with FX-05 assault rifles, the AK in his room is most likely not his service weapon. One of the most infamous weapons in the world, the AK-47 is renowned for both its effectiveness as well as its low price compared to modern firearms, and is often such associated with the criminal underworld. In fact, the AK-47 has become synonymous with cartel violence in the last 20 years making its presence in Silvio's bedroom the first clue towards his cartel connections. Just before the tunnel raid, we are given one more scene of Silvio, this time without his family, as he takes his police cruiser to be loaded with the pink drug packages. He looks uncomfortable, smoking a cigarette and staring at the floor, as the drugs that have likely wreaked havoc on his community are loaded into his police car. It's the dropping off of these drugs that leads him to the tunnel exit, and his encounter with the prosecutor turned special agent. I think Silvio's scenes are meant to parallel Kate's position with Engraver's task force, both are law enforcement officers that are part of something bigger than themselves, whether they want to be or not. Unlike Kate, Silvio has a family waiting at home for him, which could be how the cartel are able to manipulate and control him. Back at the tunnel, Kate draws her weapon and aims it at Alejandro, and demands he step away from the officer. However, Alejandro quickly draws and shoots Kate in the vest, winding her and knocking her to the floor. Standing over her, he tells her to never aim a weapon at him again, and leaves with Silvio in his police car. As night falls, Alejandro forces Silvio to drive as his radio feeds him the location of Diaz. As he drives, the officer attempts to bring up his son and family, trying to earn Alejandro's mercy, but the CIA operative coldly keeps him driving. On the US side of the tunnel, Graver and Delta Force regroup, having successfully caused a diversion to smuggle Alejandro through. After Reggie notices Kate's absence, Graver prepares to go back in, but Mesa emerges from the tunnel and swiftly punches him in the face. In her weakened state, Graver is able to quickly overpower her, and Reggie is detained at gunpoint as Matt drags her away from the rest of the team. Having calmed her down, 
Graver tells her that she took the wrong tunnel and saw things she shouldn't have seen, but Kate asks him about the name she overheard the officer give Alejandro, Medellin. It is here that we get the biggest clue towards Alejandro's involvement in the mission. As Matt explains, the Medellin refers to a time when the drug trade was controlled in its entirety by one group, allowing for it to be easily overseen and controlled by the US government. Matt tells Kate that what she saw on the other side of the tunnel was Alejandro working towards a way to restore that order, dismantling an arm of the cartel. Mesa deduces that Alejandro must work for the Colombian cartel, but Matt interjects that he'll work for anyone that will allow him a shot at those who made him, irregardless of the morality or the origin of the faction. Also, he can take revenge on the person who cut off his wife's head and murdered his daughter. Kate stands up and tells Graver that she does not intend to allow him to hide what they did behind her, and she won't legitimise their operation. She tells him of her plan to tell everyone what they did, which he coldly brands a major mistake. Cutting back to Mexico, we see Silvio's car catch up to Manuel Diaz, and Alejandro instructs the officer to pull him over. At the side of the road, Silvio uses the police car's loudspeaker to instruct Diaz to exit the vehicle and drop his gun. As Silvio exits the car and approaches Diaz, Alejandro suddenly shoots through the officer and wounds Diaz, killing Silvio in the process. Alejandro then collects Diaz and informs him he needs to drive him to his boss leveraging the lives of his children to ensure his cooperation. As they arrive at the mansion of Fausto Alcaron, the head of the cartel, Alejandro executes Diaz and heads inside, slowly dispatching the house's guards before coming across the almost empty garden. Across the grass, we can see Alcaron and his family sitting down to dinner, unaware of the man's presence. Alejandro slowly joins them at the table, aiming his gun at Fausto and instructing his family to keep eating. He asks if the children speak English, to which Fausto shakes his head, so he decides that it's the language they'll speak in. Alacon tries to question Alejandro's integrity and asks him if he really thinks the people he works for are any different to the cartels, and labels the killing of his family as nothing personal. But to the former lawyer turned hitman, it was more than personal, and he quickly kills Fausto's wife and two children before shooting the cartel kingpin in the chest. Standing over him, he executes the man and the screen cuts to black. This is one of my favourite scenes in the entire movie. The contrast of Alacon's mansion against the rundown house that this film opened with perfectly sells the disconnect between the heads of the cartels and their actions. As Alacon lives like a king in a palace while his victims were left buried beneath mouldy drywall. The theme of family has quietly punctuated a lot of this film. From Kate's found family with her officers and Reggie to Alejandro's mission to avenge his own, Sicario makes a point of placing families at the heart of the drug trade, painting them as its biggest victims. And with Alejandro killing the children of Alacon, yet another family falls victim to the brutal war on drugs. Following that harrowing scene, the film returns to Kate, smoking alone on her balcony. Slowly, she turns around as if she can feel somebody watching her, and that's when we hear Alejandro tell her to avoid balconies for a while, owing to the dangerous climate she finds herself in as a result of her connection to the mission. Unfortunately, Alejandro is not just there for a wellness check, and he presents Kate with a document that claims that everything she did was both necessary and legal, needing her signature to validate it. She initially refuses, but the hitman slowly places his pistol under her jaw, the perfect angle to frame her death as a suicide. Forced to choose between a signature and death, Kate reluctantly signs the documents as Alejandro leaves, disassembling his weapon and leaving it behind. As he walks across the car park, Kate rushes to the window, assembling his weapon and taking aim, but Alejandro just coldly stares her down, with Mesa unable to pull the trigger. Returning one last time to Mexico, we see Silvio's son standing at his father's now empty bedside, then leaving to head to his football game. As his mother watches on, the sound of distant gunfire echoes out of Juarez, a sorry reminder that the cycle of violence continues. And that's where Sicario ends, with Mesa dragged down into Matt's world of corruption and cruelty, and Alejandro having finally avenged his murdered family. Throughout this film, we watched Kate's journey for revenge pull her closer and closer to the edge, only to learn that she was just an asset to Matt, and everything she endured was just so he could validate his methods. Strangely, although Kate was the typical protagonist, she was more like another member of the audience, watching a story unfold in front of her as she slowly drip-fed information, led along by empty promises and a false sense of nobility. Kate is kept as much in the dark as the audience, with Sicario being a rare case of a plot happening outside the sphere of our main character. I think the film's true protagonist is Alejandro, especially once we learn of his backstory. Like Kate, he's driven by revenge, but unlike her, he is well aware of the lengths he will have to go to to service his goal. Whilst Kate pursues revenge through the eyes of the law, Alejandro is shown to almost be a force of nature, relentlessly pursuing his own objectives. 
much like the infamous Anton Chigurh from 2007's Low Country for Old Men, Alejandro is a deeply complicated character whose sympathetic origins are used to justify his extreme methods, and there have been many different characterizations of him that range from heroic vigilante to sadistic torturer. Some have even gone as far as to label Kate the true villain of Sicario, as her devotion to doing things the right way comes close to costing them the mission. While I can understand the frustration some might have at her aversion to Matt and Alejandro's methods, she ultimately wants the same end goal as them. Given her background in law enforcement, I think it makes sense for her character to hold the law close to her heart, even if it does seem to cloud her judgement at times. As for Matt Graver, he receives arguably the least development of the three main characters, and is perhaps a little less complex too. Matt is willing to stop at nothing to bring an end to the cartel presence in the US, even going so far as to try and install a new cartel in its place. To me, Graver is enigmatic of the CIA and their connection to the South American cartels, specifically in how he does not try to bring an end to the cartel presence, instead seeking to control it in service of a greater goal. Whilst Kay and Alejandro seek out the cartel to exact revenge, Graver looks to bring the criminal underworld under American control, although his motives for doing so are up for speculation. And that's it for Sicario. The film was a box office success and received some great reviews, gaining plaudits for its focus on character drama as well as thrilling action. Having rounded off each character's story, Sicario will undoubtedly be remembered as one of the best standalone entries into the modern thriller genre. However, the soulless machine that is Hollywood can never truly be satisfied, and following the film's wide success, a sequel was commissioned to carry on the world of Sicario, only without the talents of director Villeneuve or Emily Blunt. Sicario, Day of the Soldado, released three years later in 2018, instead focusing on Graver and Alejandro, and places far more emphasis on violence and gore instead of its predecessor's commitment to suspense and mystery. In my opinion, Sicario 2 is terrible and quite frankly should not exist, the cartel genre exploded massively off the back of Narcos and left much room for new IPs, and seeing a film I love so dearly be bastardised into another run-of-the-mill action flick is both disappointing and infuriating. I was in fact originally going to cover both films in this video, but I honestly do not think the sequel deserves any of my time or yours. I would rather view Sicario through the same lens as its director, a standalone masterpiece that should be celebrated for its achievements, and not associated with more generic Hollywood slop. And that's Sicario. I honestly feel like there's a ton I haven't covered in this video, but I didn't want to just keep talking forever and rob you of the chance to experience some of this film firsthand for yourself. In the last few years, Villeneuve's quickly become one of my favourite directors, so I thought it was important to pay homage to one of his lesser known directorial successes, especially in the wake of his recent boom in popularity. But what do you guys think? Have you seen Sicario before? And does it weigh up to some of his other directorial successes? As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below, and I hope you enjoyed my latest video essay on Sicario.